All right. It's looking to the east, looking to Japan with Steve Zercher, uh, who is a professor at Kansai Gadai, did I get that right? University in Kobe, Japan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he is also Kansai Gadai University. Okay. He is also a, um, a, a member of the faculty at the Scheidler College of Business here in Hawaii. And he's an international person. He's been an international person for many years. And he can appreciate the exchange of students um, from the point of view of an educator between the U.S. and Japan. So today we're going to call, talk about trends in international study. I guess that means uh, exchange student study for the U.S. in Japan and for Japan in the U.S. We're calling it Japan Yes, USA No. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. To you. Thank you so much, Dave, for uh, taking time to talk with me once again. Um, this is a, a subject that's very near and dear to me. Um, I originally came to Japan as an exchange student myself. I did that for one year, my sophomore year in college, and that profoundly changed the uh, direction of the rest of my life, the arc of my life. So uh, I believe in international exchange. I think I tell my students in Hawaii and also here, the ones I understand, that the, the fact that they're on an exchange program, that they're spending a semester or two abroad, is the most important thing that they can do during their undergraduate college years. But that certainly was true in my case. So now, as you pointed out, I'm a professor and also a dean at Kansai Gaida University. And uh, part of my management area is watching over the exchange program at Kansai Gaidai. And uh, of course, I, I watch closely the trend uh, in terms of international exchange for foreign students. This is a big business for America. It's a huge business for America. Um, as I think your listeners, and certainly you know, Jay, uh, a large portion of the students who are studying at American universities are not native-born Americans. And for the universities, it's uh, one of the primary revenue sources for the university because oftentimes local students are on scholarship or you know, there's state regulations that allow them to go to school at reduced rates and so forth. But foreign students, they come in, you know, they cannot apply for any of that and they're not likely to get scholarship. So usually they pay full tuition when they're studying. Like my wife went to Berkeley, uh, she's Japanese. The, the first year she was a non-resident, I forget, I think it was like $35,000 a year back at that time. Of course, it's much, much more. And the local people, California residents, were paying probably 15 or 20, so much, much less. Mm. So this is a big business. Well, there's, there's a difference too, so isn't there, in the, in the attitude that students have when they, when they come over from another country. Um, you know, uh, the U.S. is a big deal. They, they've been told and they've fully integrated the idea that you, you can get a good education here. Um, and they're, they're like immigrants, and right. immigrants are motivated. And they're more motivated. They're not here to play sports, necessarily. They're not here to uh, go to fraternity parties uh, and meet girls. Um, they're here to work hard. They're here to get a really good education, the best the U.S. can offer. And uh, as a result, most of them right. seem to me, anyway, you can correct me, are really good students. And they get good grades and they learn more, perhaps, <laughs> than the average American student in the same school. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Jay. I, I, I have to say that there is an exception that I'd like to point out. When it, when it comes to my own experience, looking for girls was an important part of my <laughs> uh, foreign exchange experience, but anyway, in general, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the foreign students that I have at Kansai Gaide, they're from all over the world. And um, visiting professors that come in, they remark, and I have the same impression that these students, they're kind of self-selecting students that go abroad. They're generally more motivated, seem to be you know more on the ball, maybe a little bit smarter. You know, more kind of aware of what's going on in the grander scheme of things. And as a result, they end up being better students. So that's my experience, my direct experience of teaching mm. over the last eight years. Mm. Mm. I really enjoy teaching mm. foreign exchange students. 
So does it work the same so way? Does it work the uh, same way in reverse? You, well, how do you find that American students yeah. who come to Japan? How do they compete with the Japanese students in the same school? I, I, again, I think it applies. The American students that come are, are self-selecting. They're a little bit more courageous than the standard American student. It's, it's still, if you look at the overall population of college students in America, the number of students that go abroad is about 10% through the course of four years. And this is short-term trips as well. So it really is a minority of the general American students that do go abroad. And I find that the American students that are studying here in Japan at Kansai Gaidai uh, to be good students and uh, open-minded, uh, curious, uh, intellectually skilled in many respects, and generally higher performers when I compare them to the domestic Japanese students who are sometimes in my classes as well. Well, let me, let me make a short rant, if you don't mind. My, my rant is this. You know, I, <laughs> I've been, I've been suggesting to the parents of, uh, you know, uh, high school graduates or college graduates here in Hawaii uh, for years and years and years that the best thing they can do is urge their kid um, to go to Asia. Uh, that means uh, Japan or China. Yeah. Um, learn the language in, in those countries um, and become a, a citizen of the world. Um, you know, have the special global globalist kind of education you can get if you study in another country. And I, and I wouldn't put down studying in Europe either, but uh, you know, I think it's really important for somebody in Hawaii who has so much contact with Asia, simply because the way Hawaii is set up, um, to go to Asia. But what I find, what I find over yeah. in the past few years anyway, it seems to be not happening. Despite my advice to all these people, their kids do not go to Asia. Their kids do not go to school in Asia. Um, and they, you know, they wind up going to the mainland. They wind up, I don't know where they wind up, but not in Hawaii and not in Asia. And I feel that's really a loss. I, I don't think we encourage the kids here in Hawaii to do that enough. I, 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 maybe we don't express the value of doing that to them and they don't incorporate that value in their own planning. Um, so I, I own, I, my rant is I would like to see more kids from Hawaii study in Asia. And since uh, China is having, you know, yeah. human rights issues and uh, oppression issues lately and surveillance and whatnot, social quota issues, probably a better place right now would be Japan. Um, so, uh, you know, if some parent came to me right now and asked me what should he advise his, his kid, I would say go to Japan. But it's not happening, is it? Well, um, a couple of things, Jay. It's a, it's a, as usual, an excellent question, excellent observation. I have the data here. Uh, this is from the Open Doors Organization. Uh, it, they study international exchange, and every year they produce a report on the trends in international exchange that applies to U.S. universities and U.S. students. So, to your point about where Americans are going, if I look at the top 10 destinations by country, um, China is number seven, and Japan is number 10. So if they do go abroad, American students, number one country is the United Kingdom, it's about 11%, 11.5%, and Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Ireland. So the top six are all European countries. And I agree with you. Um, I'm sure they have a good time, but if you look at the, if you think about the future of world economics and where the growth is, it's here. It's all in Asia. Mm -hmm. So the students who decide to go to Asia are investing more smartly, I guess I should say, in their future. Europe is not going to be growing. The UK is having tremendous problems, but yet students go there. It's probably, Jay, because they speak English. So part of the challenge of going to Asia is that psychologically, the greater distance in their head, and then also they're thinking, oh, I have to study Chinese and I have to study Japanese. So that's a part of the issue. And then to your point about going to Japan, the good news is that Japan is cool. American students do seem to have an interest in it. Over the last three years, according to this report, the number of American students 
year over year has increased. Three years ago, it increased 18 percent, and then last year, uh, 2018, uh, it increased 5 percent. And this year, according to this recent report, Japan number of Americans increased year over year 12.4 percent. Mm -hmm. That's so good. So the that... raw numbers total still, yeah, that's good. I so Japan. Um, it does seem to be a preferred destination among uh, Americans in terms of the growth rate. The raw numbers are still far below the UK. The number of Americans in the country is about 8,500 in the last year, and the United Kingdom is 40,000, so it's five times higher still. Mm. Well, you know, one, one thing that, uh, that, that I have noticed is that if you go to, say, Harrow uh, or Cambridge, um, in the United Kingdom, you are not only getting a good education, I believe they give good education there, um, but you're getting, you're rubbing shoulders with people who will be your friends for life. And it's not just social. Uh, those mm. people are going to go into business, who knows what, uh, uh, foreign, foreign service, uh, could be anything, and you will know them, and they will know you, and you will have you know, deep relationships with people <laughs> far away. It's the same thing uh, in Asia, right. I think. And, and uh, I might add one other point is that oh, yeah. here in Hawaii, there's a thing called the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, which is run by DOD. It's a Dan and Oe project uh, in Waikiki, right across from the, uh, the, uh, the, the military hotel in Waikiki. And um, Derusi, you right. know, Fort Derusi. And, and um, what happens is they invite and pay for various management, management people, both uh, business and political and military, to come from their respective countries in Asia um, and, and go, go to school uh, right there, Fort Derusi in, in the APCSS. Um, and, they, and they house them in condos that are in Waikiki. And they, for months, they get to live with each other, people from different countries. And so by the time it's over, these people know each other from the classroom setting and from, you know, living in a condo together, uh, spending a lot of time together, and they're friends for life, and they're from different countries. And so you have a built-in diplomatic connection and business connection between these various people from various countries. This is invaluable to them and to the United States, because they are, you know, they like being here. They like the United States. So result is that um, everyone involved in these programs is a citizen diplomat for life. And, and that is a very yeah. valuable, very valuable uh, asset to have. You know? um, and, I, and I would certainly right. like to see that expanded. But when you have isolationist government in Washington, wants to pull back on things like that, uh, then you lose the benefit of this, uh, you know, citizen diplomat, uh, you know, result. What do you think about all of that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just a quick example of how true what you just said is, is uh, I went to Consac Guide as a foreign exchange student, as I mentioned, my sophomore year. And I uh, went back to the States and completed my studies. And then out of the blue, one of my friends, one of my colleagues, uh, a student uh, from America as well, who was on the same program as me, um, said, I'm starting a software business in San Francisco, and would you like to join me? And uh, I didn't even know what software was when he called me, but I said yes. I ended up working there, and that's how I created my career in the software industry. It was through that connection that I had made while being a foreign exchange student in Japan. So that's how it worked out for me, which is, again, why I'm such an advocate of this. You're absolutely right. The, uh, we often have the consul generals from Australia and the United States come and give a uh, presentation to our students at the closing ceremony or the, when we start the uh, academic year. And they emphasize the same thing. You represent your country. You have a wonderful opportunity here to make connections, and these connections will be valuable to you over your lifetime. No matter what, whether you go into diplomacy or business or teaching or whatever it may be, and that's absolutely correct. So, but okay, you know the the tagline for this uh, session today was 
And yes, so we see that the numbers are up for American students going to Japan. Unfortunately, in the other direction, that is Japanese students going to America, and actually more general foreign students going to America, this report sadly indicates that the numbers are down. So the year on year for Japanese students, uh, the number of students who went abroad to America uh, was reduced by 3.5% year over year. And then overall, uh, international students going to America was slightly down about 1%. The trend over the last couple of years is a negative trend. So the uh, NASA organization, which is a trade conference uh, organization that supports international exchange, is indicating that this is having a significant material financial effect on universities in America, that they're losing approximately $5 billion because of a drop-off in international students going to America. Well, why, so why is that it, happening, Steve? I, I, mean, I, I, I know that so well. When you have a school yeah, well, like I, I, HPU here uh, downtown, uh, HPU relies on foreign students, yeah. and if the if the uh, uh, if their visas are not forthcoming, if the if the immigration service is sitting on their application of a visa or turning them down, that has a direct effect on the school that relies on yeah. foreign students. Is that happening around the country? Yes. So the numbers are um, for the last academic year, uh, the number of students coming from all sources to study in America is down approximately 1%. And then compared to 2015-16, which was the peak, uh, it's down 10%. So yes, U.S. universities are suffering now because the number of international students going to study there is down 10% from a few years ago. Now that 2015 year, what happened then, Jay? Ah, we know what well, happened You know, then. That's, that's one indication. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. That's certainly the message out of the United States now is not a welcoming message. It's, uh, you know, we're going to make this harder. The visa process is more difficult now, uh, and you know, students who are in America often are under threat, or they feel that, that their visa may be revoked as well for various reasons. Right. And this happens to some foreign students. Of course, that, that gets out into the broader news. But no, that's one thing. That's not the only thing. Uh, there are other factors. Um, the cost of education in America is skyrocketing. So American education now is the most expensive in the world. So parents who have to pay for those out-of-state tuitions are going, oh, my God, you know, I have to pay $50,000 in America, and if I send my to Canada, it's only going to be 20, or I send them to Australia, it's only going to be 20. Oh, by the way, the number of international students going uh, to other countries is skyrocketing. So the increase in the UK over this period of time is on 30, 40%. Australia is just booming. The Consul General for Australia, Jason Colby, whenever he sees me, he comes up to me and he says, thank you so much, Steve, for electing your, your current president because it's making my education business move. <laughs> He just says that to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, we shouldn't be thanking him because he's hurting. He's hurting us. He's hurting the schools, and you know my point earlier. He's, he's, yes. he's hurting the relationships, the future relationships, um, the diplomatic and business relationships that our country has with the countries that would send students over here. So when you go isolationist, it has a long-term right. effect an effect that you really can't control. Years and years, uh, you know, a, a, a diminution of the essential connection between this country and all the countries that would send students and couldn't, and all those students go somewhere else. And when you said, for example, that the Japan students um, go to the UK, well, I think some of them go to the UK because they can't get into the US. And the UK benefits, they have the, the money and the connections, and we lose in that same vein. Mm -hmm. Where else are they going? Where, aside from That's the UK, where, where are the Japanese students going? Um, I don't have the information on that. So this report is kind of American-centric. I'd have to get that from the Japanese side. Um, our, I know from my own 
interaction with the Kansai Gaidai students, the majority of them still want to study in America, but Europe is a second location. Um, some want to study in uh, South America as well, because we have some big connections with sister schools there. Um, so it's, it's spread out. But I would say the majority of and this may be just in the, because of the historic nature of our program, uh, we started in the 1970s and it really focused quite strongly on American universities. So within the student body that goes abroad from Kansai Gaidai, the, the preference still is for American schools. Mm. But uh, maybe I can look that up for you and find well, out. I'm just wondering uh, also about, about the, the cost. You, you talked about the economics, and I think that's really important. Yeah. The, and it's remarkable how much more it right. costs to go to college now in the U.S. on average than it, it cost back in the day. You know, I, I went to Queens College of the City University right. of New York City. It was a very good school. And its, yeah. it's, it's graduates are all over the country doing well. And it cost me $12 a semester for tuition. Twelve. Twelve. Um, oh, my my gosh. So, um, you know, now it costs yeah, tens of thousands. And, 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 you know, I just I wonder um, right. how, you know, and, and, and then what happens is uh, the, the students get student loans in the U.S. to pay these extraordinary charges. Um, and then uh, now Trump right. is trying to, and then there was a program under Obama to forgive the student loans, but Trump is, is not, is, is not right. respecting that. So the, then the students have to find a way to pay the loans back, which can be very, very difficult because of the amount, amounts involved. And I wonder if the student loan program, uh, taken together with the cost of American education, is affecting the students who would come from Japan. Can Japanese students make student loans under the American student loan policy? Uh, are they affected by this? I... Generally, the way it works in Japan, and I would imagine this would extend to Japanese students who are studying abroad, the contract is that the parents pay for their children's undergraduate education. Japan doesn't have the same kind of student loan or need program uh, that America does. In fact, when I talk about need-based uh, financing for students, uh, Japanese administrators at my university don't know what I'm talking about. So probably the way it works, if a child wants to study in America and they're not under some kind of exchange program, the parents are paying for that out of pocket. So the increase in the tuition at American universities would have a negative effect if the parents do the research. I mean, the son is, or daughter is saying, I have to study in America because that's where you know, I want to, then the parent will probably say, okay, at least that's my impression of Kansai Gaidai students. We're kind of a slightly richer school than maybe average, not super rich, but uh, higher than middle mm -hmm. class, I'd say. Um, so that's how, how it, it would work. So I think that the, the tuition increases in America is probably driving parents to look at alternatives. And as I mentioned, Australia, mm -hmm. UK, those number of uh, the number of enrollments in those univers universities start, is going up. So some other factors too uh, are is crime. You know, I just read this recently in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is the Bible for us academics uh, in terms of what's going on in university uh, trends and business. So you know, every other month or so, we have a horrible news coming out of the United States that gets well reported here in Japan. So there's a, also a little bit of an element of fear about studying in the United States as opposed to Canada or Australia or other places that are more safe. So that's not a major factor, but I think that's a factor uh, that's driving the numbers down for us, for Japanese students to study in America. And that would, that would include uh, uh, the gun control issue, too. I mean, uh, security on the campus. Uh, of course. For the women and, and for, and for right. kids who would be concerned about the, uh, gun episodes. <clears throat> which do happen on American Correct. campuses as well. Yeah, I think, yes, yeah, that's unheard of here in Japan. Uh, that, you know, we just, the gun laws here are very, very strict, and mm -hmm. that type of crime doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But uh, parents who are going to send their, their children abroad to America 
they do read or hear about this because it does get reported when it happens. But unfortunately, you know, it happens on a periodic basis. Let me let so, me ask you this, yeah, Steve. I'd like to bring a. Uh... Go ahead. Yes, Go ahead, Jay. Well, I, I was I was gonna you know you're yeah, an in, international say. person and you know both systems. In fact, you you know the international education in general, and you've done research on it and all that. And and if I if I was the president of the United States. Um, or Congress, yeah. assuming that Congress becomes functional again. Um, and I asked you, Steve, what, what kind of legislation should we adopt here to uh, regain, enhance the benefits of student exchange, say, between uh, the U.S. and uh, Japan or other countries in Asia? What, what would you recommend that I do in order to take full advantage of the fact that people in Asia like to study in the U.S. but are being held back for one reason or another. What should I do? What legislation should I pass? What programs uh, should I adopt? Yeah, I, I think there's two things. Um, one is non-legislative. One is just messaging that you're welcome to be here. We want you here. So I think that's a very important message to send out. And that's not being sent out now. So that's, I think, discouraging students. And then to the legislative um, aspect of this, um, I think making it easier for the students to go through the visa process instead of making it more difficult, and the government controls the levers on that without question, would be helpful. And then beyond that, one of the reasons I think also why the number of applicants for uh, two American universities is going down is because they think that when they finish their degree, it will be highly unlikely that they can work in America. So the H-1B visa program is being reduced, is being made more difficult. Mm. You know, I, I'm from the Bay Area. I grew up in Silicon Valley. You know, the number of entrepreneurs there, it's about a third or so. There's the Indian group and the Chinese group and the Korean group. Without those immigrants, Silicon Valley would not be what it is Hey, oh sure. If you look at the, you know, like Google, Google, those, those are immigrants. <laughs> you know, yes. So many examples. Yes. So we should be more welcoming people who are educated and talented, and do as we talked about before, have proven themselves by self-selecting and are willing to leave their home country, be one of the ten percent, and take the risk to go to some other location and study. Those are the people we want to stay. So I think that would be a very important thing, Jay, when you become president, that you change. And that will encourage, I think, more applications and a much more positive environment at the university level and much more growth down the road as you graduate and integrate themselves into tech or wherever they want to be. You can count on that, Steve. And that's why we have to keep talking. Okay. <laughs> we have to talk about this and other issues that affect yes. the U.S. and Japan and Asia. And I look forward to our next discussion. It's always great to talk to you, Steve. Steve Zercher at Kansai Gadai University in Kobe, Thank Japan. Thank you so much, Jay. An international educator um, and, and, and philosopher. Thank you so much.